we're talking with Stephen Porges, and Stephen has a, a deep background in the subject of studying the human being uh, from many different angles, and uh, part of it, a huge portion of his life has been spent in the academic, scientific world, uh, and I'm going to ask him to explain his background briefly. It's, it's quite uh, varied and, and extensive. Okay, so uh, it's, it's, it's very extensive and a little bit uh, complex, but I've been a faculty member since 1970, so I've been a professor in various departments. I've been a professor in psychology departments, human development department, psychiatry departments, and had affiliations in programs in neuroscience, neurophysiology, and biomedical and bioengineering. So my last four PhD students were in bioengineering. And I've been, like many academics, I've been in several institutions, and currently I hold appointments as a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where I've created at the Kinsey Institute there a traumatic stress research consortium. I hold the position of professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina, and two emeritus positions, one as professor of psychiatry at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and uh, a emeritus professor of human development at the University of Maryland. And what I often say is that, you know, longevity helps. So you've been around <laughs> for a while. And there are two things, longevity and persistence. And uh, I was in a rush in the beginning, so I had my PhD when I was 25 and was an assistant professor at 25. And so the trajectory was very accelerated when contrasted with today's uh, trajectories of new faculty. So that's my background, but the real issue is not what my degrees are in, it's what I've been interested in, and I was always interested in this bridge between psychological or mental processes and physiology. And in the mid-1960s, when I started graduate school, there was an emerging discipline called psychophysiology. I said, that's it. And that's where I started. And over time, you know, I, you know, I, I, that was my, my platform, but the platform in psychophysiology as a niche or as a society became less interested in the neural regulation of bodily processes, whether they were autonomic, meaning our organs inside our body or movements. It became more interested in cortical activity. It became cortical centric or, uh, uh, brain-centric, and that it was not really what I was interested in. I was interested in the bi-directional communication between our brain and our body. And that's what I continue to do, and that's really where the theory, the polyvagal theory, emerged as a way of conceptualizing it. In a metaphor, I was looking for the manual of what it is to be a human being. From, from a neurophysiological point of view? From, but it's not just from that, because oh. it's always going back and forth, it's always bridging. So it was, my perspectives were perspectives of bridging, bridging intuition, bridging uh, psychological processes, uh, bridging in intentionality with physiology. Uh, Stephen, in addition to your scientific and academic background, you also have been a hands-on musician and music student. Uh, and you have, I listened to an interview with you recently where you had some really interesting things to say about specifically your experience with the clarinet, but this would apply to any wind instrument. And given that many people are taught to mentally sing when they play, mm -hmm. it might apply to all other instruments as well. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as you know, sadly, tragically, music is being removed uh, as a piece of the curriculum from schools all across mm -hmm. of America. And, you know, when you look back a hundred years ago, even the poorest child in public school got music instruction. I mean, I, I'm a historian of this and I know this. Louis Armstrong learned music theory as a grammar school student in the ghetto of New Orleans before he picked up the, 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 the uh, cornet. Uh, so this music instruction was a norm and it's being... It's been removed from many school systems. The New York City school system, for example, lost it. Uh, and I know it's happening all over the country. And I think it's because somehow it's thought that music is an extra and it's not necessary for our modern world. Mm. And, yeah. and it's sort of a frivolous thing. From, from your point of view as, as a, you know, a scientist and a researcher and someone that studied these things in depth, what is it about music that's so important to us as human beings in our development? Well, let, let me totally agree with 
your concerns. I think our culture sees music, art, and even play as being distractors and taking time away from mental activities or cognitive functions. And this is a, a major misunderstanding of how our nervous system thrives. So we need to be able to regulate our physiological state to enhance our ability to process cognitive problems. So our mental capacity is basically being challenged by the deficiencies that we have in regulating our state. Now, music, uh, dance, play, all these things were very important in exercising the nervous system in different ways. Uh, and let's talk about music, which uh, I was a clarinetist, and what I always like to say is that uh, as I reflect backwards from uh, you know going back, turning the calendar back and trying to understand how I survived as a teenager or young, you know, teenage years are very complicated, and I would practice the clarinet an hour a day, and which a lot of you know serious musicians that's trivial an hour a day. But I was doing my hour a day, and I had developed my own way of practicing, which was relatively efficient. And I will also tell you that my clarinet teacher was the solo clarinetist with the NBC Symphony under Tuscanini. Wow. So uh, you know, I, I would go to New York City once a week to have this clarinet lesson, and uh, I would. You know, so I would became technically very you know proficient in playing. But the point I really want to make is that it took decades to understand what it was that I was doing. Mm. Uh, I was actually exhaling slowly because what were my warm ups? My warm ups were chromatics and taking uh, holding the tones for as long as possible. So I now I was breathing outward slowly. But I was also listening very closely to, to and controlling the embouchure, the muscles of the mouth, mm -hmm. while listening. And this, so I was working on what I now call the social engagement system, mm -hmm. which are all the muscles of the face and head. And I was functionally tuning them and exercising them and listening to the slight intonations. And I was functionally practicing with while playing the clarinet pranayama yoga, which is yoga of breath. Okay. And I have to emphasize why that is important. When you exhale slowly, the vagal calming effects of a cranial nerve coming out of your brainstem to your heart start to work. You start to enhance the inhibitory actions on your heart's pacemaker. You are calming your body down by slow exhalation. So, you know, in the world we live in, people say, well, take a deep breath and exhale slowly and you'll calm down. What are you doing when you're singing? What are you doing when you're playing a wind instrument? In my talks, I used to say all oh, about the wind instruments, how it's really quite wonderful. And then there'd always be uh, someone in the audience who was a keyboard, a percussionist, or a string player, and they would get up and they would say, you got it all wrong. We do exactly what you're doing. Huh? We exhale oh. slowly with the phrases. We're doing oh. the same thing. Okay. And, and I, but then my retort was, but with a wind instrument, you have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So in, you're entrained to breathe with the phrasing because that's how the music is written. You have no choice. And now your body is going through this calming level of exhalation, allowing this vagal activity to do its positive job, which is to support homeostatic function, which means health, growth, and restoration. But it also changes how we feel. So it's not merely my bodily organs are getting health from that. My bodily organs are now sending information up to my brain in a bi-directional manner and telling my brain, everything's good. So you <laughs> now, you get, now you're in these calm states and it can facilitate mental activity. So there's a lot, of, you know, part of the justification for music has been that it helps intellectual development. Mm -hmm. And what it really is doing in my world is shifting the ability to regulate physiological state that opens the pathways, the neural pathways, to those cortical areas that we deal with for our intellectual processing. Gotcha. So, so it's, and the other part of music is even though you may practice by yourself, when is it, the, most, the pleasure is playing with a group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you do in your group, whether, well, the part that I really liked was playing in wind ensembles. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the most, that was the fun part, because you're always looking at the people who you're playing with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're great, this is like the, the skateboard, you're creating connectedness to make sure you're all in sync, 
and uh, you you know sync both in the rhythm but also in the intonation and and you're you it's a it's you're acting out in co-regulation with in the wind ensemble gotcha gotcha so it yeah it, it, and and for people that don't know the details of your theory just briefly um i'm going to oversimplify it we we have an instrument our nervous system and it has various modes uh natural inbuilt they all exist for a to serve us um, one of those modes is the frantic flight and fright flight fright fight and flight mode uh, that has its purpose sometimes you need it uh, there's also a shutdown mode uh, withdrawing mode uh, but then there's something that you call social engagement where we're feeling mm. safe we feel trust in our environment mm. we're engaging mm. with the people around us and that is the highest uh, well, you don't, you, don't, you don't judge them as high and low, but in terms of if you want a state that allows the in intellect to flourish, mm -hmm. yeah. the social engagement mode is the one. It also gives you some other attributes. It helps regulate those other states. So uh, your sympathetic nervous system, which supports fight and flight, when you're safe and trusting and in social engagement, it keeps that sympathetic nervous system into a state of enthusiasm and energy. So that's what you're seeing when people are playful. And okay. you even can see that in music, uh, where there's kind of like an exuberance coming. That's an that's energetic part. And it keeps this social engagement system also helps regulate this so-called shutting down one. Because if you're in safe, you can have moments of intimacy with another where your body's just conform and you don't go defensive or to, in a sense fight or flight or dissociative. Gotcha. So it, it, in a way, the social engagement system is the great integrator of our autonomic nervous system, gotcha. and it keeps the, all the components from going into states of defense. Gotcha. And we live in a society in which our autonomic nervous system is in chronic states of defense. We call this stress-related disorders, and we also call it disorders of, of modern society, like gut problems, irritable bowel, fibromyalgia, all these things in which the autonomic nervous system rather than supporting our body, has been recruited in defense. And the way we tend to treat it, we tend to treat it not as a systemic disorder, but that the organ has failed us. So we even start to blame our organs, mm. try to medicate the organ, mm. even may have surgeries or procedures, mm -hmm. when we're really, uh, the ontogeny of this, the ideology of this, is that the system has been recruited in defense. It's great to be recruited in defense, but for short periods of time only. You know, we evolved for, to move back into states of trust and safety, and that's what our bodies need. And if we go back to music, music does a couple things. I went through the breathing part, but music also deals with intonations, different frequencies. And there are certain frequencies that are triggers of safety. Literally, uh, it's like we're wired uh, to feel safe when we hear it. And people used to describe Mozart as the voice of angels. Mm. And what, mm. what Mozart it isn't the voice of angels, it's really a mother's lullaby. Mm. So we are wired in our nervous system to have a certain frequency band that is going to be prepotent in telling our body we're safe. And the frequency band of a mother's lullaby is that. And if you think of a classical symphony, how does it start? It starts, at least a Mozart one, starts with the mother's lullaby. Mm -hmm. Very narrow frequency range, very melodic. And so now you feel safe, and what does it then do? It gives that melody to instruments with lower frequencies. It expands that frequency band. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the first movement, you can tolerate low frequency sounds that would have been triggers of predator. If okay. you heard the first. Okay. And so that becomes your first movement. The second movement is often associated with um, uh, monotonic sounds, like a high frequency mon uh, monotonic sound is a storm. The violins are just doing, or low frequency monotonic sound of a string bass is something bad, a predator is coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I used to use in some of my lectures Peter and a Wolf. Uh huh, perfect. Because, yeah, perfect. Because it conveys the narrative with the intonation of frequencies. It's really, it's really a beautiful teaching wow. tool to, uh, to deal with the intu intuition of Prokofiev, who was a composer of it. And I, what I often say is that it's humbling because he wrote the whole thing in a weekend. <laughs> <laughs>
but he has uh, had such great insight of how sound and int intonation of sound conveyed a story, conveyed visceral feelings. So the story works because you get visceral feelings from the different sounds. Gotcha. And in, and in a way, it's, it allows someone in a safe space to experience mm. a wide range of emotions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, and yeah. Actually, back on that, that's part of what, you know, life, we go on roller coasters. We don't mm -hmm. jump out of a 12-story building, <laughs> but we'll go on a roller coaster because we will get that visceral feeling inside safety rails. So it's not like we don't want those feelings. We, think we want to expand our life, yeah. but there's no reason to put ourselves truly in life threat. So a roller coaster, at least a well-maintained one, our mind knows it's going to be safe, our body gets the response, and now we have this life experience. So, so music, in addition to all its other wonders, can allow the young people to have extremes of mm -hmm. emotional experience without risking bodily harm, which is yeah. important at that age. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. So you start getting, the, especially the range of, of, of uh, auditory frequencies, so it starts like high pitch can be danger in most of our life, but music will also include high pitches. Low pitch is now impending doom or predator, mm. and then you can experience that because there's a resolution mm -hmm. in the narrative of the, of the music. Gotcha. So... I, I think what we've been talking about will be music to the ears of music educators who know intuitively on a profound level that music is, is I'm going to use the word medicine. Uh, yeah. It's the best medicine for, for, one of the best medicines for children we can imagine. But I'm also hoping that all educators, because educators have to deal with the fact that we have a society of autonomic d disarray and, and children that are... Um, I'm using an extreme word, but disturbed, you know, in their yeah. nervous systems. And in fact, that becomes one of the biggest challenges now for, for, for teachers these days is not mm. conveying information, but just dealing with the environment of the classroom because of the state the children are in. So I think music teachers can see the benefit, obviously, mm. of what you're saying. But I think anyone teaching anything or anybody working with children who cares about children, even, mm. you know, would want children to have the chance to learn to be involved in music. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to realize that one of the important responsibilities of our educational system with, for children is for them to del have opportunities for the term, neural exercises mm -hmm. that then promote resilience and state regulation. And when I talk to educators, I ask this one question, what would, you, what would your job be like if behavioral state regulation wasn't a problem? And, and, and could be achieved without right. external things like, you know, let's, let's talk about the 800-pound elephant or whatever the phrase is. There are an awful lot of children being put on psychoactive medications for mm -hmm. state management. Yeah. That, I don't think it's good. That's my personal opinion. Uh, if we could avoid it with something that's non-drug, I think we should look into that and do it. Well, we, we certainly should. The issue is we also have to understand that in certain contexts, there may be few options available to the families or to the, to the child. So we can't just say we're going to stop all medication. We have to say that let's, let's, be, let's focus on an alternative mm -hmm. and let's take a different perspective. Let's say that it's not uh, a, a biochemical imbalance, which was the jargon that was used to promote this yes. use, a heavy use of pharmaceuticals in kids. But say there's a neural system that needs to be exercised. Gotcha. And if we exercise it, what are the outcomes of it? From the musician's perspective, I did write in it, well, I, I was a co-editor of an issue of music and medicine. Ah. And, and there, I wrote uh, with another individual the overview uh, of that issue. And in that overview, I talk about some of this. So that's okay. about it. Oh, great. I'll, I'll see, we'll see if we can get that for the listeners. Yeah. Um, Thank you, thank you very much, Stephen, for this. Very, very helpful. And, and I know music teachers, again, will embrace it, but all teachers uh, should be aware of this. It could help them so much. Yeah. Well, let me just close with one other statement. Uh, there are many people in the field of education now very interested in polyvagal theory. And one thing that they are talking about is the role of the teacher 
as a stimulus mm. for, uh, or a trigger of neuroception. So mm. if the teacher has a bad day and comes in and de- is not responsive to the child, the child may go out, may go into tantrum. Yeah. So the issue is the role that a teacher plays in the life of children where the child is looking to the teacher as a co-regulator. And this becomes very important in your higher risk families. Uh, the teacher's responsibility is great, and we need to have an appreciation of that that role. And we also have to have an appreciation of how music can be helpful mm-hmm. in in shifting the physiological state of the classroom to enable it to be more amenable to educational challenges. So. What I recall is that uh, classrooms used to start with the Pledge of Allegiance and then a pa- patriotic song. Okay. I'm not sure this occurs anymore. But yeah. it, so already you are singing in the beginning. You're going through this, and your body is now in this more co-regulatory state, and you're better able now to sit still for longer periods of time. So interesting. And of course, in Asia, it's very common to begin a, a company-wide meeting with, with everybody singing the, the company oh. song. Oh. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.